now I'm recording it. Good. So um, I'm going to just open this up and then turn it back over to Shazia and um, Ileana. And we're very fortunate to have Ileana back with us consulting um, a, a lot on the 1115 waiver on Medicaid um, in general. And so um, I'm very fortunate to have Shazia um, step into a role that maintains the data analytic component for the Medicaid program and understanding it as well as um, having more of a policy uh, direction as well. So um, I, uh, we're, this is, webinar is not um, going to cover the larger approved 1115 waiver. We're likely to have one of those in the in the future, um, but the um, this only focuses on a section of that larger waiver that had to do with the um, Institute for Mental Disease Waiver background, and so otherwise known as uh, to all of you who. Um, have probably followed this for a long time, IMD. And so historically, um, any program that was considered by CMS to be an IMD, so any congregate living uh, facility uh, that was community-based that had uh, more than 16 beds was considered an IMD and were not therefore allowed to collect federal share of Medicaid um, dollars. And so in New York State, there had historically been some, uh, some inpatient programs that had been funded by state only dollars um, and uh, withdrawal and stabilization programs as well. And it wasn't until we carved in and created Part 820, uh, carved into Medicaid managed care and created 820 that we were able to. Um, pull down some federal and state share for Medicaid um, through the managed care plans. But that created a kind of bifurcated system where individuals with Medicaid benefit were able to be reimbursable in a residential Part 820 program only at the point of time when they were enrolled in a Medicaid managed care plan. And that's because at that time, the benefit was in the 1115 waiver um, over that create that enabled the plans to um, pay benefits to providers. And so in this case, what we um, after actually OASIS had uh, New York State had approval through that um, through the uh, 1115 waiver originally, we uh, the state the Medicaid director, the CMS issued a state Medicaid director letter that allowed states to waive completely the IMD. And so we um, worked with the Department of Health, um, who may be on this call, I'm hoping that some representation is here, um, to include this IMD waiver in um, the larger 1115 waiver that was just approved in January. And so what this does is it means that all programs that are more than 16 beds um, that are power 820 and therefore can bill Medicaid can now bill Medicaid B for service. So that means that from the beginning, um, you know, fee for service Medicaid will be allowable. And I know that's been a real, um, but you know, fiscally, uh, it, it's had some impact on programs being able to predict revenue because it's hard to predict exactly when someone will become eligible um, or were enroll, actually enrolled in the Medicaid managed care plan. Now, <coughs> Chazia and Ileana are going to talk about the specifics of this, how this will be implemented, when, and um, and and how you will access the fee for service funding, and then we can have some questions um, at the end. So I'm going to hand this over to Shazia. Thank you. And Ileana, please feel free to chime in any places that I may miss. So as Pat mentioned, um, effective January 9, the IMD restrictions has been removed so that part, all Part 820s can bill uh, fee for service for those clients, residents who are not yet enrolled in the managed care plan. 
So what, are, what is OSS doing at this time? OSS is working with DOH to load the fee-for-service rates for any of the Part 820s that did not have any rate codes uh, loaded at this time in Medicaid and eMedney. Those Part 820s who had been billing managed care, you have those rates already loaded, so you should be set. But for those um, Part 820s who were not eligible at the time, at that time to be able to bill fee-for-service, we are working with DOH to load the rates. We have one, we're running it in about two to three batches. So the first batch went out last week, and um, those providers should be getting a letter from DOH, a notification letter from DOH informing them that the rates have been loaded. This the second batch is going to go out um, this week or at the end of this week, we're working with DOH on that, and so then those providers should also be getting a letter in the mail informing them that these rate codes have been loaded. Uh, we are also currently working on updating our website that lists the reimbursement rates as well as the guidance. As soon as we have those updated, we're in the process right now, we will send out a communication to the Part 820s informing them that the website has been updated with all of their relevant guidance. So keep a lookout on that for us as well. Um, but what does this mean in terms of the Part 820s that are billing? When do you bill fee-for-service versus when do you bill managed care plans? So again, those members who are not yet enrolled in the managed care plan, the programs can bill Medicaid fee-for-service effective January 9 of 2024 service dates. However, those recipients who are already enrolled in the managed care pro program, the programs must submit the Part A20 per diem to the enrollees Medicaid managed care plan. So that continues. And we also have a link for the programs to remind them that you can use the expedited Medicaid managed care enrollment service. And the link for that is also um, on our website. And these slides will be shared afterwards. So in terms of uh, processes and regulations, in terms of provider responsibilities and notifying the plans, or also what the plan coverage responsibilities are, those have been the same as they were before. So this is just a reminder that those individuals who have been enrolled in a plan at the time of the admission, the providers are responsible to notify the uh, plans within two business days of the admission of the client to inform them that the client has been um, admitted to the Part 820. And there's also guidance online that um, providers can reference. And those clients who have been enrolled in a plan after the admission, the effective date of the enrollment into the plan uh, would be when the, when the plan would cover the um, client's coverage to Part 820. So that means that if they were enrolled after the admission, uh, into a plan, the providers can bill fee-for-service until the enrollment into the plan, and then afterwards the plan takes over covering the service for the clients. I have one more slide, and then we can go to questions. Um, in terms of plan coverage responsibility, we want to remind the providers that if the client is enrolled in a plan prior to or on the date of the admission, then the plan is responsible of covering the service from the date of admission, and the plan does not have to apply for any prior authorization criteria. And then if the client has been enrolled after enrolled in a plan after the date of admission, then the plan um, covers the service effective the plan enrollment date. Again, the providers then can cover fee for service until the client has been enrolled in a plan. And those are our updates and slides. So now we can go to, I'm going to stop the screen, and we can go to questions. You can raise your hand, and I'll go through and unmute. Or if you have questions in the chat, we can go through that as well. So I'll quickly go through the question in the chat. Will we be submitting claims to Medicaid at the same daily per diem rate as Medicaid managed care? Yes, the per diem rate will be the same. It is anticipated that rates for all 820 providers will be loaded into eMedney prior to the 90-day timely filling of 418. Yeah, we are we are trying to do that to try to get it um, in before the 90-day timely filling. However, um, there are certain um, provider eMedney Medicaid um, forms that we have to work with DOH on. So, 
if we know, if we realize that there is going to go beyond the 90-day uh, timely uh, filling, we are going to contact DOH and ask them to remove that edit. So you, as the provider, do not have to hit that 90-day um, timely filling edit. The slides will be shared. For the current MCOs, they have a specific process for prior notification of 820 to the MCO. Will this be required for fee-for-service as well? I believe not. Pat, is there prior notification for fee-for-service? I don't think there is. No, there is not. Is there contact? The way that that will work, though, just to um, to add to that question, um, that um, for fee for service, there is no prior notification. You bill it like any fee for service claim, and it's paid um, in your, um, you know, as any fee for service client would be. However, when that transition happens and a person is enrolled in Medicaid managed care, at that point. Um, you would need to notify the plan in the same way that you're doing it now. Is there contact information of where we are sending admission notifications to for Medicaid? Ashley, I am not sure what that question means, unless Pat, you know what that means. Yeah, I think that's a similar question to the one we just answered. Oh, okay. there, there is no need to send an admission notification for fee for service. That won't happen until the person is enrolled in Medicaid. Okay. Is in there a Medicaid specific... managed care plan? Sorry, in a Medicaid managed care plan. Right. Okay. Is there a specific site ID that needs to be used for Medicaid fee for service claims? Claims are being denied incorrect site ID. Yes. Yeah, so when we are loading the rates, we are loading it to your location. So each part of 20 element, which address location um, the service is being provided, that is where the load is the rate is being loaded. And um, if you do not get that straight from eMedney, the locator code, we can try to see to figure out how to get you that locator code, but there's a usually a three-digit locator code, and even the zip code, you need to make sure you're um, filling in correctly to be able to have fee-for-service claims go through. If there are any issues um, as you go through this process, um, you can email the pickle mailbox, and we can try to work out what the issue might be. At this point, can we back bill for clients that were in programs since 1924 that don't have managed care? Yes. So you can, um, yes, you can retro to 1924 and bill a fee for service. This is straight Medicaid clients only. If, yes, so if you have clients who are straight Medicaid fee for service and are not enrolled in a managed care plan, you can bill fee for service until you get them enrolled into a managed care plan. That does not mean that you have fee-for-service clients and no longer can they do they have to be in managed care plan. Either you will do it or they will automatically get enrolled after a certain point in time. So it's not, it's just something to help cover the pro, uh, programs uh, to f um, build fee-for-service so, so that they don't have to wait until managed care plans are enrolled and they get to pay, um, to pay for the services. Shazia, can you hear me? Yes. So, and, and if they're asking about people who are duals, Medicare, Medicaid, this would also apply to them because Medicare doesn't cover this service. So you can zero fill the Medicare information and bill fee-for-service Medicaid for that person. Correct. Thank you. So this case, um, when client, the same case uh, when the client has an insurance from a job um, and they cannot get an role in managed care because they have primary commercial, right? Yeah. If that commercial insurance doesn't cover the service, which they probably don't, but they might, if they don't cover it, then you can both be for service Medicaid. Um, I was under the impression that no commercial plans are covering um, the service period. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's what I said. They probably don't cover it. If they don't cover it, you can bill right straight to fee for service Medicaid. I have a question. What if the commercial plans are denying us? Um, and the client has a Medicaid plan secondary, does that mean, like, what do we do? Do we just submit with that, like, with the GY modifier to let the commercial plans, this is not covered, and then go and bill managed care? Because if we skip that commercial part, we're getting COB denials from the managed cares requiring us to build a commercial plans. Commercial plans don't cover. So I think, I just want to confirm, I, I'm sure every there are others that are experiencing this as well. It's just to get confirmation that we can, the MCOs are still requiring us to bill any insurance that's primary, whether they're covering the service or not. 
Yeah, we, we know more about Medicare because there's so many different commercial plans and they're all doing something different. So generally speaking, you probably want to try to get a denial from the commercial plan first. And then if they deny, you can bill people for service Medicaid. And I think, um, I'm not sure, I guess we don't pay the, the up to the Medicaid rate for a commercial plan. Would you agree with that, Pat or Shazia? If the commercial is the rates 180 and the commercial plan pays 140, I don't think we pay that difference. We don't, but if the commercial plan were to deny, I think that um, if the person had Medicaid, it, that you could submit to Medicaid, whether it's Medicaid managed care or fee for service, whatever the person had. Yeah. That's correct. I agree with you, Pat. The commercial plans won't accept the zero fill the way Medicare will, though. Medicare will accept the zero fill and make us but allow us to bypass it to build the Medicaid or MCO secondary. But the commercial plans are not that way. They won't allow us to zero fill. So it becomes more of a problem with us having to build to get that correct denial for them, the MCOs, to go ahead and pay us correctly. So you're saying that the Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans won't allow for a zero fill if there's a commercial. That is correct. Yeah. We're actually getting, um, um, we have a few clients who has um, MCO and MCO would not approve even authorization for the service is saying we should go to the primary insurance and primary insurance does not cover it. Mm -hmm. So we kind of stuck because commercial doesn't pay and they refuse to approve the service is saying it should be covered by commercial. So that's the example we have. Yes. That's one of the scenarios as well. So I've been trying to use the Medicare GY modifier that says to the commercial primary payer, we know you don't cover this, please deny us correctly. So then we can bill secondary and hopefully they they deny it correctly. Cause if not, we're work our hands are crossed to get them MCO to pay us. Correct. The same here. There is a yeah, issue. It should be it, oh, sorry. It should be a rare case that somebody has commercial and Medicaid managed care because prior to COVID, you couldn't, that wasn't allowed. So they, they changed the rules a little, but you could, um, I think that the person who has commercial and Medicaid managed care could disenroll from Medicaid managed care and then they would be Medicaid fee for service, which would probably be better for them and would certainly be better for you. Yeah, we cannot force them to do anything though. We cannot no, but you could, you could disenroll. Yeah, and if they refuse, which our client did refuse to do so, we're sitting here with the claim that we cannot get paid because managed care selling us deal commercial and we cannot. That's correct, because a lot of the commercial plan, plan, commercial plan holders either have it from their parents yes, or, cover them, or from a spouse that it's part of their divorce agreement or however have you that they still have to provide them coverage, but they still qualify for the managed care according to their individual income. So we can't force them not to have that commercial payer or to drop that to just have managed care is just not, that's just not a doable yeah, scenario. I'm, I'm not saying drop the I'm commercial plan. I'm saying they the can questions just in the Or is it just going to be the, the, the folks who have, who have gone off the uh, question to the chat? I'm just wondering, just in terms of process. Yeah, I agree, Jim. And I, I think this is a kind of an individual case um, by case. The pick up mailbox may be able to be helpful. I do think that there are providers that have contracts with commercial plans and commercial plans are sometimes interested in this or might be open to a single case agreement um, in, in so if they're not in network or that. But I'm sure that there are plant commercial plans that just don't pay that benefit. But I do think that we need to move to maybe, um, you know, some of the questions that are, you know, relate to this specifically. So if it helps, I've been monitored. Can people hear me? This is Ileana. Yeah. So Shazia, if it helps organize the chat, I've been monitoring the chat flow of questions and they seem to be organizing around three different major areas that I think it would be helpful if we revisited. So the first, and you know, tackle them in whatever order you want to tackle them. And the first one has to do with um, when they're submitting the Medicaid fee for service claims, what information goes on the claim related to the following things, the Medicaid provider ID, location of service, and the rates. So I think pause a moment there just to address that bucket, and then we can go into, there's also questions about 
when the person transitions from fee for service to the managed care organization, what that notification process is. So those are two of the major buckets that just different themes of that policy keep running through. So you want to talk about the pieces of the Medicaid fee for service claim first? Yes. So thank you, Liana. And I was uh, looking at that as well. So in terms of the Medicaid fee for service, you are using your Medicaid billing ID that you usually use for to bill managed care plans, the same ID, the NPI and the MMIS ID, your Medicaid ID that you would use. The rate codes are going to be the same three rate codes, 1144, 1145, and 1146 for rehab, stabilization, and reintegration. Um, all of this will be online, and if, if you have already been billing managed care, you're using the same rate codes as you would for fee-for-service. The location would be, again, the locator code that is for the site where the elements are and along with the zip code. So you're billing fee-for-service. Um, similarly, you should be billing fee-for-service the same way that you would be billing well, for the elements that you would be billing the managed care plan. What was the second um, yeah. bucket? So the next theme where bucket tends to go around, um, it has to do with the IMD waiver exclusion and program size. And there's questions circling around is, does Medicaid fee for service have a bed size limit like underneath the IMD exclusion? So people are looking for clarification, excuse me, no. that, that the fee for service availability is there regardless of bed size. So pause for a moment on that one. Great. So this is what this is. This is what the MD waiver is doing. The exclusion is doing is now no bed size limit. So all Part 820, all the three elements, regardless of bed size, um, can bill Medicaid fee for service. And for those clients who are not enrolled in managed care plans, for those clients that are enrolled in managed care plans, regardless again, I believe for bed size, yes, you can bill managed care plans. And then the next bucket of questions, um, the general topic is authorizations, and it splits into two streams. Clarification about prior authorization, is it needed, yes or no, for individuals who are Medicaid fee-for-service? So we'll pause there. No, there's no prior authorization. And then the next bucket streams into the um, flow of information when an individual enters into an 820 program as a straight Medicaid fee-for-service person, and then they transition to being enrolled in a plan while they're on stay at the Part 820. So then that's the second question, what's the process for that? And you had addressed that in one of your slides using the current documentation, so we'll pause there. Yes, and I can share the slide again. <clears throat> So for those individuals who are enrolled in the plan after being admitted into a Part 820, the provider's responsibility would be to notify the plan. They must inform the plan or the insurer of the enrollee who has been admitted uh, that they're receiving Part 820 um, treatment and provide, them, pro provide the plans with the initial or most current treatment plan. Um, and from the plan's perspective and responsibility, for those recipients who were enrolled in the plan after the date of admission, the plans would cover the service effective the date of the enrollment of the client. So what that means is that if you have someone who was admitted and then were enrolled in a managed care plan, the time period from admission to enrollment, fee for service would cover. Then after enrollment into the plan, the plans would cover the service. And I have now lost a visual on my chat stream, so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Let us see if there's anything else. Okay, well, let's go to raised hands. Um, Shakia Lee, if you're able to unmute yourself. Hello. Ooh, echo. Oh. Oh, no. It's echoing. I want to know about the process going backwards. So if the person was in uh, managed care and then they lost coverage, would we be able to then Medicaid in the in-between? And would we, you're saying, you're saying we don't need any alt at all for Medicaid, correct? As you now you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, that is correct. So if you, they were to lose coverage, they would go fee for service. So you would um, cover the, the fee for service would cover those services until they were back on to managed care plan. 
And is there a time frame for how long they can bill Medicaid before they get into the plan? No, there isn't. Uh, James, you have your hands up. Thank you. Yeah, so we're seeing a, a growing number of of folks with uh, severe mental illness and they're coming in with uh, on uh, uh, social security and and straight medicaid are are those my our understanding is that those folks are carved out of mco and and is is that is because then with the question would be follow up would be would we be able to charge the whole uh, duration of their treatment to fee for service medicaid so the answer to the first question is no. Um, SMI is no longer a carve out um, for, um, and in fact, they would likely enroll in a HARP um, plan within the Medicaid managed care plans. Um, however, there are sometimes it, um, reasons um, that people aren't enrolled or aren't enrolled quickly in managed care. So there's no limit on how long you can bill fee for service as long as a person isn't enrolled in a plan. So if for whatever set of reasons that lasted the entirety of treatment, you can do, you can bill fee for service during that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jackie, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is around patients that are in a dual plan where they have Medicare Advantage and a Medicaid managed through the same plan and it's a dual. Are they still required to pay the Medicaid rate? Um, yes, they would be paying the Medicaid rate. And we're actually working right now on the Medicaid Advantage um, plan contract updates, so we should get that also out quite soon. You will have information on that as well. Thank you. Dorothy Radcliffe. If a participant, um, if the managed care decides that the participant isn't uh, meeting the medical necessity for care, can we then go back to Medicaid and bill Medicaid? No, and Pat, I'm sure you can talk in more depth of why the plans would be denying that for medical necessity. But Thank you. no. Yeah, go ahead, Matt, Pat. Go ahead, Pat. No, that, that, I mean, that you can appeal that decision, but you can't um, go back to fee for service. That would that claim would be denied. Jeremy. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, I know that you said that there's no limit on the length of time that you can bill FFS, but I, I would imagine that you guys will be tracking uh, the length that somebody remains on FFS um, before getting enrolled in a managed care plan. I was just wondering if there is a amount of time that would trigger some type of flag about a person remaining or an average length of a group of people remaining on FFS. And then the, the second part, I guess, is I would also imagine that um, Billing FFS would potentially open us to OMIG audit um, and uh, whether or not that's the case and whether or not it would open uh, all of our FFS billing to um, OMIG audit or just the part 820 uh, billing. Hi. I mean, all Medicaid, I mean, oh, OMIG, um, audits can happen for any um, service. And, I, you know, I, I don't know, Willie, on if you want to take this one, but, or, um, or if legal is on, but it, I mean, any time you bill Medicaid, there is a potential of an OMIG audit. So I don't think this is a, in any kind of an additional risk. Um, hey, this is, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, this is Liliana. I got, even though I'm in the office, my internet is unstable. So, yeah, just totally echoing what's saying what Pat is saying, um, you know, OMIG is always an element, whatever Medicaid is part of the conversation. And then just to pause for a moment is the time period that the individual would, would be in fee for service status. Um, there is still that expedited managed care enrollment process that programs are at liberty to use. And then the algorithms and assignments for when people get auto assigned, those things are still in play. So individuals would be in fee-for-service for a particular point of time. 
And if either the expedited enrollment process is not pursued, they will then default into the algorithm for auto assignment. Yeah, let me just say one thing here. The, if somebody comes to you and they're in fee-for-service Medicaid, the probability is that they'll never go into managed Medicaid. People, if they come to you and they're new to Medicaid, they've never been on Medicaid, then within the next month or two, they will be put into managed Medicaid unless there's something that keeps them out of managed Medicaid. If they come to you and they're on fee-for-service Medicaid, there's probably something that's keeping them out of managed Medicaid, like they're a dual or they have any number of these exemptions or exclusions. So. It, it's not inevitable that they're going to go into managed Medicaid in the next month or two. It's unlikely. Uh, Julia, you had your hand up. I think you're on mute, Julia. Oh, sorry, my, my computer's just a little bit slow. Unmute it. Um, so I'm going to apologize. I heard about this meeting late, so I, I logged on late. Um, were there slides at the beginning of this? Any yes, slides they were, and we, yes, and we will share them. Okay, so you'll email them out. Even if I wasn't yep. signed up for this, will I still be getting, can I put my email in the chat maybe to receive? Yes, go, um, go ahead and put your email in the chat, but you should be getting it through, um, we'll, we'll be sending it all to the Part A20 providers. Okay. But you, can right. put, you can put it in the chat as well. Okay, I'm going to put my email in the chat and then um, I think already, you know, just in the couple of seconds that I've been on this call, I think a lot of my questions have been answered about the, um, how long can they be on uh, be for service. Um, and then that auto enroll thing, which is uh, an interesting thing. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, Jeff. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I just want to make sure I'm hearing correctly. In this scenario where someone comes in uh, or someone is enrolled in fee-for-service Medicaid at the point that they come in, for a period of time they have fee-for-service, we're billing Medicaid, there's no notification to the state of admission, but at the point that they're enrolled in a managed care plan, we are sending the most recent treatment plan and, and the locator as if it was a new, new admission. Is that, is that how this is working? It, it, you would be sending, so as soon as the individual is enrolled in a plan, you would be sending, providing, letting the plans know, notifying them of the, um, of the client being admitted into the Part 20, and yes, giving them the most uh, initial or most recent treatment plan. We would do the same thing as how you would have done it before to um, inform the plans. Right, the appendix A. They usually want initial locator, appendix A, and the most recent uh, locator. Right. So the treatment plan, if this is happening mid episode of care, would substitute for the appendix A, I guess. I we, submit, we submit always our initial appendix A. That's what they usually want. Or you can, they'll ask for it if they need it, if you don't submit it. I believe it would be the end of show. Hi, Go ahead. Sorry, this is Jackie coming in. How are you? Um, usually what they request is the uh, locator, um, the appendix A initial, initial treatment plan, whether it's when the person first come in or even if after the MCO has been chosen and is active, they still want the same documents as if um, they already had MCO when they came in. Hello? Yes, yes. I'm sorry. That is, that's correct. Yep. Thank you for working. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question on uh, programs, bundles to the DOH letter, and if we can begin to back bill the fee for service. Um, you should be receiving, for one batch, you should be receiving the DOH letter either this week or the next week. And we're, again, we're sending another batch to DOH, and so hopefully in a couple of weeks. And yes, uh, you, as soon as you get the letter and you're informed and you're aware that you can bill, you can back bill to the effective date of service uh, starting January 9, 2023, 2024, sorry. Um, let's see. I 
think we have answered most of the questions here. Julia, you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, mm -hmm. Could you also include um, maybe in those emails any guidance for uh, dual clients? Like Medicare and Medicaid, if there's specific guidance and billing guidance, that would be very helpful. We will be updating our guidance website, and as soon as we do that, we will be sending um, you guys the link, and so everything on that will be should be on the website. Um, Chazi, can I add uh, because I'm looking at questions in the in the chat, and yep. they're going over this the same kind of um, uh, territory. So I just think. Mm -hmm. If you took a client from the beginning and admitted them on fee for service, there's no one to notify at that point. You bill um, straight Medicaid fee for service, just like you would bill any other service if you're familiar with doing that. And then at um, some point, once the person is enrolled, and like Alan said, it may not be every person, but anybody who's then enrolled, then within two days of that enrollment, you do have to notify the plan. I do agree with what Jeff said that a treatment plan might suffice at this point and even be better than Appendix A, but the plans are now expecting an Appendix A. And so, um, you know, we're gonna have to do some work with them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, that the locator and the Appendix A are what the plans are expecting in order to know that there's a patient that they're now responsible for, and you would go on then billing and and working with the plans in the same way that you're working with them now, unless there was an interruption. And if the patient um, or the resident um, was um, uh, left that managed care plan for whatever reason was disenrolled, you can pick up again and bill fee for service until there's another enrollment, and then that would repeat. And I thought, Alan, did you have something to interject there? Nope. Okay, I, I thought I heard you guys. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. No, I was on mute. <laughs> I apologize. I have a follow up question on that. So, if, so if a client misses their research, would that be a situation? Then we bill Medicaid, and then when they're able to recertify, when or like it's finalized, then we switch back to managed care. Is that how that goes? So, if they missed their research, they would be disenrolled, and they wouldn't be um, on medic on Medicaid at all. Correct. I guess I meant if they miss something with their their health plan, like re-enrolling, or if they okay. were dropped, like you just said, they were dropped. Yeah, at that, that point, if they were dropped off the Medicaid managed care plan, you would go back to fee for service. If they were dropped off of Medicaid altogether, they had to do something to reconnect. They'd reconnect to fee for service. You have ninety days back to you know the uh, um, until at least. You'd have the time frame back to when they were disenrolled from Medicaid managed care and that time forward until they were re enrolled. Okay, thank you. So I love these questions, like who would provide the authorizations and who would do the clinical reviews to approve the continued stay? It shows me that there are people who um, lived in the world that who 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 didn't live in a world pre-managed care. <laughs> so, so, so fee for service Medicaid, you it's a fee for service. You um, bill them for the service, they pay you back. Um, so there is nobody in that role um, at that point um, until the Medicaid managed care. Uh, plan it, the person is enrolled in that Medicaid managed care plan. Kazi, do you see any other questions? I've scrolled um, through and I don't see I'm anything scrolling. new. 
through one. There's one that asked that does this replace bundle billing? This is per diem billing. There's no bundle billing in this one, unless you're thinking the same thing, but this is part A20s. And it's the same per diem billing. So it's the same as how it has been before. I don't see anything else coming up and I don't see any hands raised. Oh, no, wait, sorry. Jeff, you have your hand raised, you're waving. Go ahead, and then James after that. My, uh, my, my colleague, Julie, asked the question here that maybe you didn't see. She's saying, is there always fee-for-service for fee for service coverage after the MCO lapses? So in other words, maybe someone gets disenrolled from an MCO mid-treatment episode. Do they have no coverage or is there a mechanism for reverting to a fee for service? I believe my understanding is that if for some reason the client has lost their managed care, they probably could back to go to fee for service until they get back onto a plan. But as per the previous conversation with Pat said, if they completely lose Medicaid coverage, then that's a different scenario. Um, but if whatever reason for rationale, if they've lost their managed care um, coverage, they probably could revert back to fee for service until then they're enrolled back into managed care. Okay, thank you. James? A, a more comment and question. So I really just have to note uh, the work that OASIS did to, you know, fill a hole, uh, you know, to really support the uh, efforts that I know the not for profits are making to make a 20 a, a, vi a, vi a viable um, treatment for uh, for the, those who need this level of care. So just have to recognize hats off to you. Pat on behalf of the field. Thank you. I know it's you and Keith and others that probably made this all happen, but but I think it's a great, uh, a great uh, thing. It really, uh, Andy, uh, it really was DOH and we work closely with them, but um, they also, I don't know if Amy Clinton um, or uh, Serena um, are on this call, but they were great partners in this. Um, and, and yes, this has been something we've wanted um, to pursue from the beginning um, and, um, and, and really do hope that this is uh, going to make uh, 820 like really, you know, much more operational on the fiscal side and the fiscal planning side. Um, we will be sending the slides out after the after this meeting. Um, and Jay, you had your hand up. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I think I heard someone say that if um, if a commercial plan pays uh, partially, that we would not bill Medicaid fee for service for the remainder, but we have historically we've always done that so i don't know why there would be a change in that we'll look into that jay i mean i don't um i don't i don't know why it would be different other than it's a per diem and uh, you know, I, but we'll we'll look into it and see if there is a way to balance to um, balance bill um, by crossing over to claim. I, yeah, because I'm not. Yeah, because we've kind of had to do it both ways. Because sometimes what will happen. So we've been able to bill for some of our programs. We're um, we're excluded from the IMD. So we've been billing uh, Medicaid fee for service for those programs all along. And what will often happen is. Medicaid fee for service will will be paying, and then out of nowhere, a commercial plan will coverage will show up, and they'll pay us something, and then we have to, you know, notify Medicaid fee for service of an overpayment and reconcile that with them um, to 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 balance it. So, with your Medicaid managed care plan, you've been balance billing it um, from well, e either plan. or or Medicaid fee for service. Oh, you have it under sixteen, so you're actually yeah. you're the most experienced person on this call. Yeah, we've been we, so we've been doing that for just one of yeah we've we've been doing that from the so beginning. One of your programs um, yeah. has that has okay. 
So, um, so actually offline, let's, uh, let's connect on this so that we understand what you're doing and how it's working. And we can add that to our, um, uh, you know, our, our guidance, um, when, when we update that. Okay. That, that, that sounds good because then it, it starts to, you know, get into the Omega realm of like, you know, self-disclosure when you have those sort of situations. So, you know, we want to make sure that that's right, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think we said no, because we hadn't set up a mechanism for it. So, um, you know, uh, but if that, I, I don't think that it's an Omega issue. So we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll take this back and, and um, try to understand with you how you crossed over those claims and um, yeah. make sure with, with Department of Health, and I don't see anybody from Department of Health on, but br bring this question back and make sure that we are clear on our guidance and that's also protective then. Yeah, I mean, the only piece of it that's a, it, an OMIC issue is that it's a Medicaid, if it's a Medicaid overpayment, then you have to self-disclose that right. and, you, and you have to um, document the steps that you've taken to rectify that. So in this case, if, if you've received a partial payment from someone else, then you have to document, you know, all of it, you know, in, in terms of your, if, if you've received a Medicaid overpayment, if that makes sense. It does. Okay, thanks. And um, again, the effective date is January 9, 2024. And um, one of the questions was, that is the location going to be added or automatically happen? We are in the process of adding the location to Medicaid if they have not already been added. Um, so then you would bill on the locator code and the zip code that um, is assigned to your Medicaid ID. And it is for each location, each address that you have the Part 820 element. Okay. I think uh, we've addressed most of the questions. I don't see any hands up. Oh wait, Dominic, Peter, is the, I think you're raising your hand. You may have to unmute yourself. Yeah, you're gonna to have to unmute yourself. Hi, at, at our location, or at our location, we have 40 clients, uh, 40 residents. Do we we can bill for all 40 if they're getting, you know, services, right? At this one location, because I hear 14 and 15, we have like 40 people here. Yes, if you've got if if your 40 clients are Medicaid clients. Um, and you you can bill fee for, and they're fee for service straight right now. You can bill fee for service Medicaid until they're enrolled into a managed care plan. To which point, then you will be billing the managed care plan. Thank you. All right. Do you see any other questions, Pat? Not in here. No, I think we're good. This is great. We'll also capture all of the um, questions that you have in your chat, and we will work to ensure to address them in the guidance that we are posting. So hopefully we'll have all that covered in there as well, or most of it, as much as we can on there. Just to recognize Deidre's uh, celebratory uh, emoji, this is a day. This is a, a day we've been waiting for for a while. So, thank you to Jim and Deidre, and uh, just it, it, it. This is good news. Absolutely. Well, if there's nothing else. Um, oh, okay, here's another one. We will need to provide any documentation for retro billing for Medicaid fee-for-service. No, 
effective January 9th. So if you've got services for clients coming in effective January 9th, 2024, go ahead and bill Medicaid. You don't have to tell them, you don't have to inform them, you don't have to do anything, just send them a bill. <laughs> after you get the letter. <laughs> after you get the letter, yes, after you get the letter. All right. Excellent. Um, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So we so if we had client prior to January 9th um fee for service, are we able to bill for them before um, um prior to January 9th? No. If uh no. This is effective January 9th. Oh, okay. One other question. So once the client becomes um, managed care and we have to send in a, um, Appendix A for the admission um, for, um, so if they was there a month before, do we, um, I think you answered this question, but it was it was not clear to me. Um, so do we send in, do we have to send in a new locator for the effective date of the managed care or we send in the admission locator? Um, that's a great question. And I think it would be best to do, um, to send the admission. Um, and you might want to also send a concurrent re uh, review so that the plan knows that you that the person is still in need of this level of service and we will also meet with the plans to help them understand what to expect to try to reduce any of the hiccups that could happen there um they are not used to seeing it this way you know in the past you've provided all that cert so it's really no different than it is now, really, right? Because you're providing a lot of service that you're not billing for, and you're only letting the plans know at the time that they're enrolled. So um, they're used to kind of seeing people who have already had service, um, and they're blind to the fee-for-service um, billing that you're doing. So whatever you've done to now should be very, but however you've informed the plans of people who have been in service for a period of time that you haven't been able to bill for should work in the same way. But we'll also inform the plans to try to reduce any confusion that they have. Okay, because I had that situation in the past that a client was fee for service, the beginning of the month he became MCO. So I sent in the same locator and she was like, no, I need, we need a new locator. Um, so it's like a, a new admission, but he was already here 30 days or more. That makes, that makes sense. It, yeah. I mean, ideally it would be a concurrent review, but because they haven't seen that patient before, I understand why they would want to have that admission um, locator for the date that they're new to the person. So we'll, we'll, we'll get some feedback from the plans on this, but I, 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 I think do it the way you've always done it. Um, and so if what people are asking for in the, is an admission locator at that point, that's what I would send them just to avoid any any issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, Shazia, I think we're done and even if we're not done we'll have to schedule another time because we're at our time we are we are thank you so much everybody we will take all these bye questions bye. and I will. thank you yeah. bye